So without further ado, I am really happy to introduce today's distinguished presenters. Gregory Schneider, the Executive Vice President of the Claims Conference, Dr. Ayal Kaminka, Director of the International School for Holocaust Studies, and Lily Safra, Chair of Holocaust Education at Yad Vashem, and Dina Liebman, Chief Operating Officer at Israeli Foundation. They will lead us in an important discussion on the issues of the lack of knowledge and understanding of the Holocaust, what the problems are and what we can do to combat them and create solutions. And I know it's been an extremely busy few days with Sunday being the, you know, the international day uh, to commemorate um, the Holocaust and the different reports that were just coming out. So I really appreciate <coughs> all of you taking the time to, to speak to all of us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass on to, to Greg. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tamar. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the Jewish Funders Network um, for putting this together uh, for this session. We're really um, happy to have the opportunity to talk about the survey and the results and where we think we are in terms of Holocaust education or Holocaust knowledge um, with this latest survey in Canada, um, but really sparking off a conversation about Holocaust education uh, worldwide. Uh, particularly my pleasure to be on the panel with someone from the Azraeli Foundation um, and Yad Vashem. The Claims Conference has a very close relationship with both um, and so really happy to be here with um, very trusted important colleagues from uh, such important organizations. The Claims Conference, just to give some context, the Claims Conference was founded in 1951 uh, with the goal of representing um, the Jewish world and Holocaust survivors in negotiations with, at the beginning, the government of Germany for compensation and restitution. So um, pensions, one-time payments. And over the years, the, um, the needs of Holocaust survivors has changed. Um, and so the requirements um, of the claims conference has changed also. But even from the early days, Holocaust education was important. For instance, interesting that um, I have a colleague from Yad Vashem, um, in 1953, when Yad Vashem was founded, 50% of the cost of the creation of Yad Vashem was provided by the Claims Conference. So you can see even from the very beginning, even from the early days, um, the Claims Conference has, has focused on education um, while fulfilling the main mandate of compensation and restitution. So this issue about surveys came up about a year ago when we um, first did a survey about Holocaust knowledge in the United States. Um, and the results were shocking, really, really disappointing um, about how few people really knew um, about the Holocaust. Um, and then we knew that we wanted to do a second survey, but during the course of the year, the Azraeli Foundation, who's been really a leader in Holocaust education um, for, I don't know, 15 years probably, um, in Canada came to us and started talking about doing one in Canada. Um, and that's when they commissioned um, this this uh, survey the, whose results we just released um, this week. So I just put together a few slides, um, which I hope are not repetitive of slides we're going to see <laughs> during this conversation, but uh, I think it's four or five slides that just highlight what I think are the most important um, findings um, and, and really um, for us show really where we, we need to go. So let me just, not exactly sure how to do this, I do share, right? And then this. Okay. All right. Are you guys seeing the slides now? Yes. Very good. Okay. So this is the first slide, um, probably one of the more upsetting ones, which basically shows um, the question was what percentage of Canadian adults, and then you see broken down uh, millennials and, and Gen Z, um, who are not sure if they've ever heard of the Holocaust. Uh, of the Holocaust. Have never heard of the Holocaust or not sure if they've ever heard of the Holocaust. And you can see that for all Canadian adults, it was 15% who had never even heard of the Holocaust and 22% of millennials. Um, so the millennials are basically up to eight, when we say millennials and Gen Z, um, it's basically anyone up to age 36. So it's a quarter um, of people 36 and below in Canada who say that they're not sure, they've never even heard of the Holocaust. Obviously very upsetting. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, let's go back. Right, okay, so the second one, um, which is the most jarring to me, um, and I think to a lot of people, is when asked 
to name at least one concentration camp or one ghetto, 49% of all Canadians and 52% um, of millennials could not even name one concentration camp. So that means not Auschwitz, not Warsaw ghetto, not the Lodz ghetto, not Dachau, nothing. And to not even be able to name Auschwitz, a place that is synonymous with, with evil, um, is just shocking. When you have half of all adults who can't even name one, obviously it's indicative of a significant problem. Um, part of the issue, um, and I actually found this shocking, but part of the issue is the lack of a personal connection. Um, so when we asked, have you ever visited a Holocaust museum, 89% um, of Canadian adults had never visited a Holocaust museum. And 69% said that they didn't know or know of a Holocaust survivor. Now, not knowing a Holocaust survivor, I didn't find that shocking. But 89% of adults having never been to a Holocaust museum, that is pretty shocking. Um, now we come to a, um, a question or two that I think relates to the fear. The first was about really ignorance. The second is about fear. If I could kind of boil it down to the key issues. Um, could something like the Holocaust happen in Canada today? Now again, this is not a knowledge question. This is a perception question. What do you think? 27% um, of Canadian adults thought it could happen again. But interestingly, almost half, 48%, said that something like the Holocaust could happen again in other Western democracies. Not necessarily Canada, but in some other Western um, democracies. Obviously very alarming. Um, should people um, be allowed to use Nazi symbols? So only 8% of people thought it is acceptable for an individual to hold a neo-Nazi view. Again, only 9%. So here it shows that people don't think it's okay. They don't think um, that holding Nazi views is okay and acceptable. It's just a lack of knowledge. And again, there's some questions I didn't put up on the slides, but there's some questions about um, denial. And there's not really significant denial. So what we get from this is it's not that people are saying, no, the Holocaust didn't happen, we don't believe it. It's that they just don't know about it. Um, but they do, once they do know, think it's important. Because here is the most encouraging, which is all students should learn about the Holocaust while at school. That was the statement and how many people agree. 82%, whether it's um, millennials or whether it's Canadians in general, 82% agree that all students should learn Holocaust in the school. And this is the most, I think, the most important, um, the most important, well, certainly the most encouraging figure that comes out of it. Um, and the, the follow-on question, it is important to keep teaching about the Holocaust so it doesn't happen again. 85% of adults agree with that. So people clearly understand the connection between teaching in school, learning about the Holocaust, making sure that it doesn't happen again. They understand that connection and they want it to happen. It's just that it's not happening. It's certainly not happening very um, effectively. Um, let me just stop the sharing. Okay, we're back. So for us, it leads us to some really basic conclusions, which um, are almost identical, although the numbers might be a little bit different. It's not as dramatic um, as the results from the survey in the US, but it's really the same conclusion, which are conclusions. One, um, <coughs> there's a woeful in inadequacy in the knowledge about the Holocaust. It's just shocking and depressing, um, and people really don't know about the Holocaust, its significance, and the lessons that we should be learning. Number two is that people understand that the lack of knowledge is problematic because it could lead to the reoccurrence. It could lead to um, anti-Semitism, obviously, um, and the possibility of something like the Holocaust happening again. So learning the lessons are important. Three, there is no significant Holocaust denial or resistance to learning about the Holocaust. It's not that people don't want to hear about it. It's not that people are disinterested. It's not that people say, oh, this didn't happen. This is not relevant to me enough um, at all, which is very encouraging. And four, that people firmly believe that it should be taught in schools, that it's very important. So the challenges for us, and I guess five is an easy takeaway, is that the problem gets worse um, in younger cohorts. So people, and there you have the direct correlation between knowing a survivor, being familiar with it. So um, the further away we get from the event, the less likely people are to know about it, but not less likely to understand its importance and to want to learn about it. 
So all of this brings us to our conclusions, which are there is a disconnect between what people say is important and our public policy. And what we really are saying is that they need to be aligned. People say learning about the Holocaust is important, then we have to put the resources into learning about the Holocaust, making sure that it's taught. So number one, there's the issue about it being mandated in schools. Um, it's a little bit like um, setting the table. It's important that the table is set in order to be able to eat the meal, but it's not the meal itself. The mandating um, a Holocaust education, whether states in the US or provinces in, in, uh, in Canada or extrapolating to anywhere in the world on a federal level in any country, is important. It's better that it's mandated than it's not mandated, but it's not the end of the story. The question is what resources are being brought um, to making sure that it's being taught in, in an appropriate way. So the most important thing we think um, is teacher training, and that's where we invest a significant amount of resources, as I know the Azraeli Foundation, and I hope they're going to talk about that, um, to give teachers the tools to be able to teach appropriately. So that it's mandated is important for us. We think it's very important and should be done. That it's funded appropriately. Funding means that there should be curriculum available and materials available, but it also means the importance of teacher training because to you know, parachute the teacher into a classroom to deal with an incredibly difficult, challenging topic and not to give the tools is really unfair. It's to like tie the hands of the teachers behind their backs. So um, encouraging, um, teacher training seminars and workshops um, and funding them um, is very much on the agenda. And then just the last thing um, I'm gonna say and hand it over to my colleague Dina from the Azraeli Foundation um, is we have to be more creative in the ways that we're telling the stories of the Holocaust because A, Holocaust survivors unfortunately as we know are dying. And so in a world without survivors, what will Shoah education look like? And B, younger people, the younger you are, the more likely you are to learn in different ways, differential learning. So digital technologies, um, obviously we think movies, the Claims Conference believes movies are important, um, uh, which is why we invest in three or four movies per year. Um, but emerging technologies that we think will capture the attention of younger students, um, um, we think is, um, is important also, and that's why we're investing in those areas. So that's sort of a summary, um, and I'm happy to stop now, hand it over to my colleague, Dina. Um, and what we really wanted, by the way, the three of us or four of us as we discussed this um, webinar, uh, what we really wanted to have more of a conversation, um, which is why we're all trying to limit our, our comments, because um, certainly I could talk for another three hours about this, um, but I'm gonna stop now and hopefully have time at the end um, for some conversation amongst all the participants. Thanks. Dina? Can you hear me now? Of course, my headset had to uh, die right as we were, <laughs> right as I had to start. So uh, thank you very much, Greg. And I think that you've set up a lot of what I want to talk about. I think that there's overlap, but very complementary um, uh, overlap in some of the things that uh, that we're doing. So I'm going to share my slides now. Uh, you will find that there are a couple things that are <laughs> that are that are duplicates. Uh, can everybody see the slides? Okay, good. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the Azraeli Foundation um, because I think of the three organizations that are represented here, we might be the least known uh, outside of Canada. Um, the Azraeli Foundation, hold on, um, has a vision to remember the past, heal the present, and enhance the future of Jewish people and all humanity. And we are guided by the mission and vision that were shaped by our founder, David Azraeli, um, who was a Holocaust survivor himself. Um, we are the largest non-corporate non foundation in Canada, and we're both a granting and an operating foundation. And so when we talk about what we're doing in the space of Holocaust education, we both have an operating program and we run activities by ourselves, but we are also a funder of Holocaust education across Canada and indeed across the world um, in a number of areas. The broad theme of education runs through everything that we do, um, though it reaches from classic Jewish education to scientific research um, to Holocaust education. 
we are, uh, our signature pro program in Canada is the Azraeli program and series of Holocaust survivor memoirs. Um, we publish the first person memoirs of Holocaust survivors who came to Canada. And we distribute them to educational settings along with pedagogical support. So this is a small representative samplings of books that have come out in the last three years. But at the, at currently we have 84 authors. We've published 54 books in English and 35 books in French. And in 2018, we distributed just shy of 33,000 books in Canada. And uh, since the beginning of our program, we've distributed almost a quarter of a million books um, mostly in Canada, but not exclusively. Um, the core of our educational framework has been to teach the Holocaust one story at a time. And I think that one of the things that we really got out of the study is there's a desire for Holocaust education, but um, for many, many students, the concepts are far too big to conceptualize. Six million is a number that they can't absorb. Um, and it literally happened last century. But if the, their entry point into the educational framework is reading the memoir of a Holocaust survivor, many of whom are writing about an experience when they're about the same age as the, as the high school student who's reading the memoir, um, there's a personal connection which becomes the basis for other opportunities to educate around uh, the memoir. Um, we do very, very dedicated um, outreach. Um, we have focused in the last number of years on uh, taking our Holocaust survivor speakers, our author, um, our survivor authors out to meet students. Um, but we know that we're in the last couple years of being able to do that. Um, our focus really has started to deepen in the last number of years about providing um, teachers with greater tools in addition to the memoirs that we're providing to them. Um, one of the things that we know is that there are really good teachers out there. And in Canada, we're quite privileged that all 10 provinces do have Holocaust on the curriculum somewhere. But there's no depth to it. There's no requirement for depth. But what we know is the more teachers are provided with the tools and the resources and the, the, the knowledge and security in their knowledge, they can do some really wonderful things. And in fact, teachers who have very little knowledge with a little bit can do a lot. So we had a, we had a teacher in Quebec who did not know the term anti-Semitism. When she learned about it, she doubled down and has become a fabulous Holocaust educator because she recognized her own limitation and really made sure that she was making sure that her students didn't follow her path. Um, I'll show you a couple other things that we do a little later on, but um, let me explain to you why we, you know, this is again, speaking as a funder, why did we choose to, um, to some degree replicate the study that the claims conference had done um, is because we knew that it would be important data for us in our activities, but also for all of our partners on the ground across the country, be they uh, Holocaust Memorial Centers, um, federations, um, policymakers. Um, we wanted to be able to provide that tool to them, also to the claims conference, because now they're able to um, speak more than just American data. Now they're talking about more than one country. And certainly I, 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 I think that the claims conference feels the same as we do. We hope other funders step in in other countries and really um, take this a little bit further. Um, so we asked the majority of the same questions in the United States, but um, we changed a few. So Greg already showed this slide. This was the Canadian data. It's roughly similar to the data that, that was um, found in the United States. But then we looked at some other things. So there was a question in the United States about what countries were affected, uh, what countries, what were the countries where the Holocaust occurred? Um, and I'm showing this as an example of what we were looking at was, do you know about the Holocaust? But we were also looking for more in-depth knowledge. 
And in this one, we actually added some countries that we thought would resonate with Canadians. So the Netherlands, you know, is one of those things where we certainly hope that, um, you know, anybody who's reading Anne Frank, there, there's a connection there. But the Canadians liberated the Netherlands. And that is part of a story that Canadian students will be learning when they learn World War II history. And these are pictures from the memoir of one of our authors, Claire Baum. And these are photos of her being liberated by Canadian soldiers. And so we wonder if Canadians knew, um, if Canadians could connect, make that connection. And as we discovered, it's pretty limited. Um, the other thing that we wanted to test locally is, you know, uh, what, what was Canada's policy on immigration during, in the years leading up to and during the war? And one of the reasons we wanted to ask that is, I think, aspirationally, Canadians right now think of Canada as a safe haven for refugees and that we are welcoming of refugees. And so we wanted to test if they actually knew what that was like. And what was interesting to us was that 19% knew that we had closed borders, which was the policy um, infamously referred to as uh, none is too many. Um, and uh, we actually asked the question about the MS St. Louis in November. The study was done in September. In November, the Prime Minister of Canada got up in the Parliament um, to apologize for Canada's um, denial of entry for the refugees on the MS St. Louis. Um, the number of Canadians who had heard of the MS St. Louis was 13%. 68% uh, had not heard of it. So it was lovely that he apologized. Perhaps that provided a little bit of Holocaust education in and of itself. Um, the other thing from a policy perspective that was gonna be important for us is, you know, certainly for our own work, that only 69% of Canadian, that 69% of Canadians do not know of, um, know or know of a Holocaust survivor. First person memoir gives them that personal connection to a survivor in their story, but 89% of Canadians have not visited a Holocaust museum. That is largely because there is not a standalone large scale Holocaust museum in the country. And when we asked where the Canadians who said they had been to Holocaust museums had gone, it was Yad Vashem, it was the USHMM, it was um, other sites in the United States, but very, very limited in Canada. So from a policy perspective, the Montreal Holocaust Museum, we are the lead donors on a planned um, standalone museum in Montreal. Um, and this will be um, an important tool for them to be able to speak um, to the multiple levels of government that we hope will come in and partner on that. Um, what have we been doing? As Greg showed, um, there is a desire that there's, there is this acknowledgement that Canadians, uh, that uh, Holocaust should be taught in schools. Um, but, um, and there's an acknowledgement that what is being offered in schools is not good enough. And so we are working on developing curricula that we could actually, they're, they're written to, to the provincial curriculum, but actually flesh out what should be, you know, you must tick this box. Well, now we're gonna show you how you can actually animate what goes into that curriculum. We're developing that across the country. Um, we've hired an in-house education specialist to do that. Um, we're working with international partners, including the USC Shoah Foundation to enhance their Canadian content. Um, we're working with Yad Vashem on teacher training of Canadians, of Polish teachers, um, and more. Um, and I think the, the last thing that I'm gonna say um, on this, um, that we're also doing academic work um, to try and raise the level of academic um, at the university level, higher level education interaction with the Holocaust uh, and the use of Holocaust memoir as a tool for um, both research and for education. And so we ran um, two uh, workshops, two uh, academic workshops, one in Toronto, one in Montreal on sexual violence and the Holocaust. Um, and um, we've, so those are ways that we've um, 
started to take what we're doing beyond the borders of, um, of the classroom. Um, and I think at that point, I think that's a good um, connection now over to Ayal and what Yad Vashem uh, and their role in this. So I'll turn it over to you. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, this is good. Thanks, Dina, and thanks, Greg, and, and um, thank you, uh, everyone. And I'll, I, I won't repeat on all that. Thank you for all the organizations, everything was said. Um, I actually, Dina, um, I'm, I'm starting with, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this because uh, a few days ago, it was the 27th of January, and I held uh, a little event in my house uh, inviting um, a Holocaust survivor who is a very um, um, far, uh, dis um, a, a distant relative of my wife, uh, to talk for the community and it was held in, in our our house and I didn't know her story and at the end she held up a book of her memoir and I saw it and I saw that it was partly funded by the Israeli uh, Foundation and I, I was almost in tears so uh, <laughs> that was a personal connection to, to your work. Um, I want to start with an unanswered question, which I'm going to answer at the end, but I think we're basically dealing with um, the hard question, the big question of what is the future of TLH, which is teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Um, so before I answer that, and I'm going to give the answer at the end, um, a little bit about the International School for Holocaust Studies. I think everybody knows Yad Vashem. I think, um, you less know about, about the, the ISHS, the International School. Um, we are a world educational center um, and we pretty much have a world view of educational trends. We work with almost 70 uh, different countries around the world. Uh, we develop the pedagogical philosophy of how to teach and we train the teachers. Uh, we train students. We also work with decision makers and influencers. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, last but not least, we, we pioneer educational technology to, do, to make the outreach for audiences that otherwise will not have any chance of reaching uh, or coming to Yad Vashem or even being exposed to, to good sound quality uh, information about the, the Holocaust. And we um, we do a lot of online work. I'll, again, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. In general, and I want to, I, I want to focus based on all the things that you saw. I want to, I, I want to focus on a worldview, and also from a point of view of, of the practitioners. Okay, because we work in the field. We do. We work with the teachers. We go inside the classrooms, um, around the world. Um, so I think we have a worldview. And when you look at the, at the world, I think there are two competing phenomena in the educational world. One, uh, we see a lot of um, systems and people and educators going away from the event. We see Holocaust denial. We see a lot of ignorance. And we see a lot of ignoring, um, both by chance, some deliberately. Um, and maybe the hardest thing that we see, we see a lot of competing narratives. Um, people change, the, the, the slogan or the title of, of will be still the Holocaust, but um, the content will be different. And I'll give examples in a minute. However, the competing phenomenon is, the, is an interest. Um, interest in, in creating a meaning and we, we do see the, um, a lot of people viewing the Holocaust as relevant to the young generation. When I say relevant, I mean meaningful. And I think our challenge is to make the Holocaust education meaningful for uh, the young generations. I think it's doable, I think it's possible, but the question is, of course, there are a lot of challenges. The question is how you do it. So the context of the Holocaust creates educational meaning, I said that, but the complexity and the need for sensitivity demands professionalism. 
And teachers often lack that, not because they have bad intentions, but because they lack the proper training. And this is what we're trying uh, to do. And I think uh, Greg and Dina uh, talked about that. Um, I want to um, I want to dive deeper into some of the challenges that are in the educational um, field and highlight them uh, because these are important and some of them are general challenges um, that are unrelated to the Holocaust. But when you teach about the Holocaust, it, it's even stronger. Um, I want to see with I, I want to start with two challenges, general challenges. One is the educational systems in the world. So the educational world is confused and it seeks new models that come and go. You see a lot of models, uh, nothing seems to work properly. One of the reasons is that there is a huge gap between technology development around the schools in the society, but still the schools are very traditional in their essence. They haven't changed for the last 200, 250 years. And that gap creates a real problem uh, for teachers, for kids. Um, a lot of the problem goes into uh, another problem that uh, I want to present, and that is the attention span of kids. And everyone, if, if you have kids, you know that uh, the attention span is decreasing and the teacher needs to create an entrance every, every other minute. Um, the possibility of, of giving a lecture of two hours, three hours, even a lecture of, of, of an hour, um, I don't know, seeing a movie of, of an hour is something that you, you need to get the, the movement going. Um, and it's almost uh, in, impossible for, uh, for teachers. And that influences the type of materials that we need to create for, uh, for the teachers. Um, if you want to teach the, the Holocaust properly, you probably need uh, at least two days to explain you know, the basic concepts of what is the Holocaust. We don't have these two days. We don't have two hours. Now, what do you do? How do you, how do you explain what is the Holocaust in five minutes, in 10 minutes? Otherwise, the kids will not be with you. Um, it brings me to the role of information. Uh, so students seek data outside of the classroom. And this creates a huge, huge challenge because some of the, of the data that they encounter is what we create, what we um, uh, call now fake news, right? So fake, fake data, and some of it deliberately, some of it is not deliberately. Um, I'll quote you, um, um, I, um, I wrote down a, a quote from uh, a student uh, of ours. Uh, he says, everyone knows now that there, there were no gas chambers. I saw a film about it. So Greg talked about films. Um, I, uh, two years ago, three years ago, I talked to my son and uh, he said, well, I know uh, what Auschwitz looked like. And he never been to Auschwitz. At that time, he was um, maybe 13 years old. And I asked, and I told him, how do you know how Auschwitz looked like? And he said, well, I saw, I saw the X-Men movies. And it took me about five minutes to understand that he's talking about the X-Men, you know, the Hollywood X-Men. And he saw the evil Magneto and the evil Magneto with his two superpowers was a Jew. And he had a number on his, on his arm. And some of the scenes were, were kind of in the, in the spirit of, of, of a concentration camp. And this is the information that he got. And this is very, very alarming. So how do you create movies? How do you create content in the internet that is, um, that is true to history? OK? Um, I'll give another example about Hollywood movies if we have time at the end. So another challenge, Holocaust education is not mandated in many states and countries. Uh, it's not and will never be the core of what we must learn uh, in schools. By the way, not even in Israel. Um, it's not in the core. Uh, it's very important, but uh, the meaning of that, the teachers don't have enough time to teach. We will always fight over their time. And a good example of that I can give is um, I talked to um, a few months ago, I met a Spanish teacher. Um, I met her 
in Italy when uh, we when we had to work in uh, um, with uh, IRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And this uh, Spanish teacher is a, is a graduate of, of uh, Yad Vashem. And I asked her, listen, I, wa I want to, you know, um, know the truth. How much time does uh, um, an average teacher in Spain has to, to spend on teaching about the Holocaust? And she, I mean, she took a while to, to calculate and she said, well, we have a course for 16 years old. And um, during this yearly course, we need to teach everything starting from 18 something all the way to today. So if I calculate more or less, I would, I would say about 20 minutes. And I said, what? I mean, how can you teach in 20 minutes the whole spectrum of, of the Holocaust and the, the complexity and, and, and everything? So again, this is very, very um, alarming. Uh, the other topic is anti-Semitism. And I think it, um, it was uh, showed in the, in the presentations that we just saw. Uh, we have um, um, a world view of that. We know that anti-Semitism is growing in Europe uh, as well. I can give you facts and figures a little bit. Um, about 50% of the people in Europe think that anti-Semitism is a problem, and more than a third think it's getting worse. Um, we get a lot of quotes from, uh, from students. The Holocaust was Jews' punishment for killing Christ. This is actually a quote from a student in the USA. Um, the Jews carried the Holocaust against the Poles and the Germans were under Jewish control. This is a saying, a quote from a student uh, in the UK. And the list is very, very um, long. However, by the way, almost 70% of Europeans, and this is a survey that was released, just, I think a month ago uh, from the European um, uh, Council, uh, about 70% say that they are not informed about Jews and their customs and their habits, that they don't know anything about the Jews, and still there is a rising anti-Semitism. Um, however, four of 10 think that the Holocaust is, only four of 10 think that the Holocaust is sufficiently uh, taught in schools. This is a bad sign, of course, because it's not sufficiently taught in schools. However, it's a good sign because we have something to rely on. Enough people think and feel and this is aligned with the Israeli and the claims uh, uh, survey that enough people feel that they need more, and it's not sufficiently done. And we want more, and it's important to do some uh, to do uh, more. So um, I can talk more and more uh, also about the trends and what is considered to be relevant in in education. Um, as I said, um, the fight over narrative is very strong and it's getting stronger. For example, why to teach about the Holocaust? We have other genocides. Or why to teach about the Holocaust because it's not relevant because it happened a long time ago. Um, I can tell you that in some countries, and I can, I can give you a shocking example, in Poland, for example, in uh, Poland with the new law and everything and everything that is happening in, in, in that country, um, two years ago, I sent someone uh, there just to, to get a feel of, of of you know of the narrative, and um, we participated in a course of IPM. That's the, uh, the national Polish national uh, organization that that is responsible for um, for the narrative, uh, the national narrative. And they were talking about three holocausts, actually not one, but three holocausts. One holocaust that happened to the Poles by the Germans. One one holocaust that happened to the Poles by the, the Russians and one Holocaust that happened to the Poles by the Ukraine. And um, when someone asked, you know, what about the Jews? Uh, the answer was, well, the Jews are part of Poland, so it's not, they're not a separate uh, item. They're not a separate story in that, um, in, 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 in that piece of history. This is very, very uh, alarming. So we have other challenges, uh, world without survivors, et cetera. These are uh, things, uh, we talked about that, but uh, just to list a few of the answers and a few of the solutions that we're doing, and I think Greg and Dina started to talk about that, um, we need age-appropriate materials and I would say culture-appropriate materials. Uh, so we need to be very exact in the materials that we're, that we're producing and adapt them to every culture 
that we work in. I think a good example is, uh, is uh, for example, a program that we have in the United States uh, together with uh, partners, the Schwab Foundation's IDL. Uh, it's called Echoes and Reflections. Some of you uh, know that and even some of you uh, maybe support that. Um, this, uh, this is a program for the public schools in the USA. Um, we have German materials in Germany, um, different focuses for different groups. Um, so we can give again a lot of exciting ex examples about that. The other, of course, is the teachers' training. As I said, teachers lack the proper training. And even if we have teachers that want to teach about the Holocaust, they need guidance. And this is something very, very extremely important. And we can do that in the, in the different cultures. We need a variety of activities. Um, a project that we did in Chicago, for example, uh, and a very exciting project, partnering with the local Jewish schools. And we got students, we trained students, we trained survivors on how to tell their stories, and we trained teachers on how to teach. And then we got everything and everyone together uh, just to meet, um, to, to tell the stories, but it's more, it was more to tell the story. It was to create social, a, a mini social network between students and uh, and their local survivors, um, and, the, and it, it was a very very exciting uh, uh, project. Um, this week uh, in Israel, we held a musical evening, um, making a, um, an educational process with the students, having them um, 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 perform with uh, with songs that survivors gave them. Uh, survivors just remembered songs from their childhood and the kids performed, but they performed with their own style. So that was kind of um, um, uh, letting the, the, the students and letting the, the young kids um, speak their own language, but still learn um, from uh, 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 learn the historical facts and, and going through educational uh, process. We do, of course, the, teach, the teachers' seminars, uh, and we have more than 70 international seminars um, um, every year. Um, a poster competition, a worldwide comp uh, um, poster competition. Uh, we also work with decision makers. Uh, as I said, we work with the UN, uh, UNESCO, etc. So these are some of the things that can be done, um, I think must be done, and this leads to my first initial um, question of, what is the future of TLH teaching and learning about the Holocaust? And I think the, the best answer is the future is what we'll make of it. So if I quote Elie Wiesel, he said that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. So I think we need to be, uh, we took it upon ourselves not to be indifferent. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for all that information. I know I'm digesting a lot of it right now, thinking of some questions. I wanted to open it up to everybody on the, on the line to write me in the Q&A if you have any questions um, for our panelists. I know that there was a lot of information, and, and they're all willing and really happy to, to field some questions. As we wait, I guess I'll shoot a quick question to, to all of you and whoever wants to start, um, that would be great. So there's, the, we talked about some of the issues, we were talking about some of the solutions and interventions that we can think about putting, putting there is into, into practice. Is there one or two things that you would like to see almost immediately done? Um, in the next year or two after with this now having this data to try to push um, and if so what would you say would be one of the first or one or two things that you would want to to operationalize i know that that's there's a that's um, I, can, I can start i, I would have, greg, go ahead greg start yeah <laughs> um yeah, so there's a, there, there's a lot. The, the survey that we did last year was about the United States, and this one is about Canada. And there were tremendous similarities. Not everything was the same, but there were tremendous similarities. And um, by design, most of the questions were the same so that we could do a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, and as Dina said, some of the questions were different or were tailored specifically um, for Canada. Um, so for instance, when she was speaking about 
um, the number of people, the percentage of people who had been to Holocaust museums. And I think it was 89% of Canadians had never been to a Holocaust museum. We had the same question in the US survey the year before, and it was 80% in the United States had never been. Now, uh, we need to think about what that really means, because of course the United States, there are many, many, many more people. Um, and you know, it's a much bigger country, maybe not geographically, but um, population. Um, but on the other hand, there are Holocaust museums and lots of them, um, or you know, in urban centers, certainly, in Chicago, in LA, in Houston, obviously in New York, in Washington. And so what does that mean when 80% of Americans have never been? So um, in terms of, to get back to the question, I just, um, uh, uh, I think we need to think about this as country or region specific because the very, very important issues that they all raise relating to Eastern Europe and the competing narrative is a, one of the most serious challenges facing, I believe, facing the Jewish people and the history of, uh, of the Holocaust going forward. But that's a different challenge than exists in North America. It's just very different um, environments. Um, and so the approaches, I think, have to be very different. For the United States, I can say that one of the things that I think would be very important is to ensure that there's a Holocaust commission in every single state. And it's a local Holocaust commission that then works with the legislature to get Holocaust education mandated in that state, it's state mm -hmm. by state. But then more importantly, once it's been mandated, hopefully, which it will have been, which I think now we're up to 12 states um, out of the 50, um, is then to work with school boards to make sure that the type of problems that Ayal um, and Dina has raised, that it's not two hours out of an entire school year curriculum that's devoted to Holocaust, number one. That number two, there are materials. That number three, the teachers know how to teach and um, or, you know, have the tools, and that there's some context. To read, if you look at the data from the survey, lots of people in Canada have read Anne Frank or have claimed that they've read the diary of Anne Frank. But when asked, um, where the Holocaust happened, and then they, they say many, many, most people can say Germany, but very few people can say the Netherlands. There's obviously a disconnect. You haven't really understood the diary of Anne Frank if you can't say a basic thing like the Holocaust happened in the Netherlands. So um, the short answer um, to a very complicated question is, at least for the United States, one of the things we would like to see and that we would like to work towards is a Holocaust commission in every state that is mandated with looking at these issues within the context of their own state, working with their legislature, and then working with school boards to make sure that they have the proper resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I would also just add, I think that the, that the other thing that, that we have been focusing on, and you know, this study was done among a general population in both countries. Um, what I think would be interesting is if we looked at this within the Jewish community, because awareness is not an issue in the Jewish community, but I would venture to guess that knowledge is. And one of the things that we've really noticed and that we're, when we look at our teacher training, we want to work with Jewish schools as well, because commemoration is not education. Mm -hmm. And so having Yom HaShoah where you light candles and perhaps even hear from a survivor without context, without education, without a developed curriculum around what you are offering, of course, age appropriate. And we also know in the Jewish schools, kids are going to learn about the Holocaust at a much earlier age than they're going to be exposed to it in the public school system. But it is incumbent on the Jewish community to also take a look in and out in itself and really start to parse out what is education and what is commemoration and start to make that flip uh, to make sure that there's depth in Holocaust education within the Jewish community. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, so I think I'll jump to that unless, um, yeah, let's just jump to some of those. So I think we touched upon this a little bit, but what, what role do regional Holocaust museums play in helping to deliver content and training to the communities they serve? Um, I, I don't know if, Yal, you want to talk from a Yad Vashem perspective. I know that you're in Israel, so, so maybe a Greg or Dina would want to tackle that. 
I'm going to go ahead, Dina and Greg. I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just say, say very briefly. I, I think that the role is very important. Um, so Yad Vashem has a global perspective, and we work wherever. And also the, 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 the field of responsibility is global. But the local, uh, we always try to partner with local partners. Mm -hmm. And the local partners, uh, local museums, organizations, etc., uh, they have the best knowledge of what is going on in their own um, um, community, uh, in their backyard. And I think their role is very important. We actually, a uh, lot of uh, um, museum leaders and directors and organizations from Berlin, because they had a problem of not enough people visited them. Uh, and they wanted to get our guidance of how to how to make it happen, and also to collaborate on joint pro projects in order to get more people to their um, um, uh, to their facilities. Uh, I think this is uh, this is um, again very very important. Uh, the question is how you do it and uh, what materials, etc. I would say that one of the things that I that I think is important, and it's something that we've been really focusing on on the the when we go out into regional communities with Holocaust survivors, it, it again it comes down to teacher training. So what resources are you providing to the teachers in the classrooms who are coming into your museum? Are there requirements that you're setting ahead of time? So those students come in, into the museum with an understanding and some context, either beforehand or an expectation of some curriculum afterwards. So the visit to the museum isn't just in isolation mm -hmm. to tick a box that says, okay, we've gone to the museum, but rather part of a larger educational framework about educating about the Holocaust. Sure. Okay. Um, just in the in the interest of time, I'll just jump to the next question. I know we can yeah, we can spend a lot of time on each of them. What are your thoughts on Holocaust education for the younger generation? So, young kids, preteens, and how how to best start with that? Okay, so um, as a, as a practitioner, uh, I would say it's a very good, excellent question and. It's very much influenced by the culture. Um, so in order to answer it, I will need to know in what country and what is the context. Um, I'll give an example. In Israel, for example, we must start at a very er early age to provide materials that are age appropriate. Uh, not necessarily because I want it as, as a father or as an educator, but because the, the public sphere demands it because there's no escape. The public sphere is that there's a, a, a great awareness of the Holocaust uh, from age zero. Um, so in order to, 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 um, to have the teachers um, uh, be meaningful to the kids, uh, starting from kindergartens, they need to have appropriate tools. So we, we came out with a spiral program, age appropriate, and we actually toned down a lot of the things that we saw happening in Israel providing age-appropriate tools for, for uh, teachers. Don't talk about the gas chambers. Don't talk about the awful things in kindergarten, in, 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 you know, until age 15 or 16, some of the teachers did that. But that is the specific context of, of uh, Israel. In the United States, you have a context of the Jewish communities versus the, the, public, um, the public sphere, the, the non-Jews. Um, and, the, and, the, and the answer would be different. Um, to, the, to, to these uh, different sectors. Sure, well, thank you. Do you have a, any quick thought about how about in America and Canada and the difference of like what age would be appropriate and what kind of content? So actually in Canada, I would really like to hear uh, Dina talk about it and Greg in the United States. Uh, I think they, they know a lot of their uh, own communities, but as, as a quick answer to a very complex question, yeah, I, I would say if the if the you know the kids um, if the kids are not from the from the Jewish origin and in the public sphere, I wouldn't start it at a very early age. Um, the understanding of a very complex um, um, piece of history 
uh, and you want if you wanted to be true to to that um, um, to that era, uh, I would start in a in a, um, a later age at around the team um, when they're um, um, 13, 14, 15 depends what schools if it's private schools, public schools. It depends a lot on the on the on the kids themselves. Uh, in the Jewish communities, I think that the answer is different. Um, it's part of the, you have different questions about identity and about collective memory that you need to address. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, I guess I'll sh just jump to the to the, our last question that we're going to take this afternoon is, um, they're curious to hear how the panelists think about measuring and evaluating the impact of their work, either on teacher knowledge or more importantly on students' attitude and behavior. Or zooming out, where do you see compelling evidence of impact in the field of in the field of Holocaust education more broadly? And I know this is a big question for three minutes that we have, um, but but maybe we'll go a few extra minutes if you, people will indulge us, and if and if and if you have a, a a short answer for a tough question, I know it's a hard one to end with. I'll I'll just jump in quickly. It's Thank you. one of the things that is. Um, probably the biggest challenge for us, I think, um, and where we're spending a considerable amount of time. So in terms of evaluation um, and measuring impact, um, we built into the application, if anybody wants to apply to us for a grant, built into the application from the beginning is a requirement of, a, of an evaluative tool, um, but that's a self-evaluation. So the, or, the, the recipient, the beneficiary, has to build in some sort of self-evaluation, like the teachers have to fill out surveys at the end of the um, course, et cetera. There's not a tremendous amount of empirical um, um, data about effective, what makes effective teacher training programs, and so we're spending a lot of time on it. There is some data out of the UK, um, and so we're trying to leverage some of that but it's one of the things that we'll probably be talking about significantly over the coming years is imp uh, data, empirical data on looking at what are the most effective forms of teacher training. Thank you. Okay. Um, any last thoughts that anybody wanted to share before I close? I, I just want to share one quick thing. I, I saw that there had been a question about technology, and so I would just invite everybody um, who's interested that one of the things that we've done as an educational resource is that we created a digital media platform. It's an online tool that allows um, students of high school all the way through, through uh, higher education to engage with um, Holocaust education online through the lens of memoir, through our stories. Um, but one of the ways that it's one of the one of the resources to teachers of that is that um, they can use it in a classroom where students register and teachers can actually monitor how students are using the tool and um, and and use it as a classroom tool more than just going to a website It's highly curated it's it's very developed but also teachers can give assignments that are very closely linked to it. Um, so if you go to memoirs.azrielifoundation.org, you'll be able to find that tool. Anybody, and, and so that's an example of technology that, that we're putting out uh, to empower teachers. Um, and if anybody's interested in getting a copy of our educators um, catalog, would be uh, very happy to provide that. I think Tamar can provide the link to make sure that we get that out to you. Definitely, definitely. Okay. If well, I could, if oh, I yeah. Could, yeah. Let me just, um, uh, my concluding word. First yes. of all, thank you. Thank you for, for putting this together and thank my colleagues for doing this. Um, it, it was a pleasure. Um, I, one of the things Dean and I had discussed before, but we didn't really get a chance, is to, is to not let, I think Dean was actually used the words, not ever let the opportunity go by without speaking about welfare needs for survivors. So we just want to say both the Azraeli Foundation, of course, the Claim Conference, is spending the bulk of our money on welfare needs. And if any funder is interested in providing funding for welfare, um, we're more than happy to talk about that. On the website of the Claims Conference, maybe the foundation also, um, is um, about 20, there are about 20 more slides. I think we showed together, we showed like five or six of them, but there are 20 or 30 slides about different data relating to the, um, 
to the results of the survey. And of course, anybody, I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues also, but feel free to email certainly me, but I'm assuming my colleagues also, any specific questions or anything you, anybody is interested in, in following up. Thank you. All right, well, I, I wanna say, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah yes. I'm sorry, do I have a one minute or not? Uh, um, you, sure, I, yeah. <laughs> So I ju I'll, ju I'll just refer the audience to the question, to the answer that I, I wrote. I, uh, there was a question about technology. Yes. And we, again, we don't have time, but um, but there are um, a lot of activities like the MOOC courses and the video toolbox and and the social media which we we use. And this is a hard and challenging platform to use, but we still, if you're not there, you're not you don't exist. So how do you use that for for education? These are the things that uh, we do, and I'll, I'll be happy to elaborate uh, uh, to anyone um, who can approach me privately. Thank you, and I will send out an email in the next day or so, I'll put together some of these resources and I will send it to all the participants. So I wanna thank all the panelists for your time today and also for your, your work, it's so important, and thank you for putting in all your, your time and effort to, to to do what you do. Um, I really appreciate that personally and, and professionally. So thank you so much. And thank you for all the, um, thank you for all the participants for, for logging on and being part of this and learning with us today. And that's what makes our community happen. So thank you all.